but w- why is there an underlying assumption that uh, this AI boom will need petroleum and not um, other sources of energy? Yeah, there isn't. I mean, it doesn't need any oil. What it needs is uh, is natural gas. So okay. that's you know that's the same business essentially because because of the interruptibility of solar and wind, all these data centers need highly reliable constant power, and therefore, in order to offset the variability of solar and wind. You need basically nuclear power, which they've been shutting down in California and New York. Um, and if you don't do that, then you simply you have to use either coal, which you can't basically use now. So you have to use natural gas. So okay. it's bullish for the oil and gas industry through natural gas. Paul Sankey joins the program. He is the president of Sankey Research, the number one ranked independent research company in energy. And we'll be talking about his outlook in the broad energy markets and specifically his outlook for oil. What will the oil price likely end up uh, later on in the year? Uh, What is the floor and what will possibly be the ceiling? What are the geopolitical and economic forces driving the oil price today? We'll be discussing all these themes. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hi, thanks. Uh, The oil price has averaged around, um, I would say $80 a barrel between 2020 to 2023. I wanna start with your larger, uh, bigger themed outlook uh, for the energy market and uh, basically your thesis for the price uh, going forward into 2024 and beyond. And then we'll break down into the more granular aspects of your thesis. Okay, sure. I mean, uh, the oil market has reached heights that we are all time high. So basically demand for oil is, is still hitting new highs. In fact, demand for coal is still hitting new highs, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, that's a major challenge, obviously a major environmental challenge, but the reality is that we're at over 102 million barrels a day of demand, you know, 1,200 barrels a second. And if you know how big a barrel is, uh, mm-hmm. which is as big as you imagine, it, it's a lot of oil. And, you know, we have a tremendous weight of global population. So what we're you know looking at here is 8 billion people in the world of whom yeah. approximately a third don't use a whole lot of oil. So on the one hand, the demand side looks very well underpinned by growing economy and growing population. There's obviously a couple of major shifts that are happening. The obvious one I'll leave to last, but essentially we continue to use oil for transport and trade uh, at all ships and trucks essentially use it, trains. And petrochemicals remains huge and growing and particularly in emerging markets and oil is a big destination for, uh, is a a big use of uh, petrochemical industry and making base products so those two elements are extremely powerful and then you have the whole debate which could take us three hours on electric vehicles and their impact um which is happening actually very rapidly in china uh very successfully there's a couple of countries such as norway where you have almost 100 percent sales now of evs and then you've got obviously the whole theme in the us which is really faltering sales and the lack of popularity of evs i always say evs are the least, the most slowly adopted mass product in the history of mass products. So that they are a mass product. It's just taken them a hundred years to get anywhere and it's not going that well. Right. But there's a few shifts at the margin, but the bottom line is essentially that GDP and population will continue to drive demand growth. The stunning aspect of record demand is that we have more than record supply. So we actually have spare capacity, which tends to put a lid on prices. Saudi is holding back at least 2 million barrels a day of production at the moment in order to maintain prices. They are the lowest cost marginal producers. So if they were to produce that oil, they would crater the oil market. But for now, they're holding that oil back from the market and that's causing the market to tighten. And as we go into summer, we think we'll move from that price today, which you mentioned is also the average price we've seen for a few years of around $82, $85 Brent. We just hit 80 on WTI. Uh, you know, I think the potential is there really depending on what the Saudis do to push the price a bit higher. We think they want 95. They more or less said they want $95 oil. Uh, they need 80 to balance their budget. And the other 15 is basically expenditure on growth, which they're doing in a very big way. So they want higher prices. And we think with seasonality favoring them going into summer, mm-hmm. we'll keep running with the oils. And just to to finish, the mood has turned bullish oil. And so what you're seeing with the NASDAQ at all-time highs causing people to wonder if they can really buy any more is a good laggard trade in oils, particularly if the price is rising. So we need to head to more towards 90 to get really happy about that trade. But at the moment, it's working, and, and that's essentially where we're at. We're looking for the price to be in a range. 95 is the, is the highest you'll see this year because of Saudi spare capacity. The economy is strong enough that we don't need to go a whole load below 75 as we weaken post-summer. 
and that's a good environment for the oil. So we think they'll make a lot of money and they'll return a lot of cash to shareholders, which is essentially the argument. Okay. I want to come back to the OPEC plus uh, and the supply side of the equation just a bit, but let's talk about the demand side. You mentioned to me offline there's a relationship between AI and the need for energy. Can you comment on this relationship? Yeah, I mean, for, for years, US power demand has been flat, actually, and that's been very positive. It's essentially pertained to things like more efficient refrigerators, uh, LED lights, etc. Mm -hmm. And this is what's interesting, because essentially, the utility industry is naturally sleepy. It's a natural monopoly, you know, regulated by states that essentially allow the companies to make a given profit. And it's not the most dynamic industry in the world by a very long way. You know, you say utilities and people's eyes glaze over because it's just very boring. The provision of electricity has been for the past 20 years. But what we've got now, these NVIDIA chips are remarkable and they're big. And each one is a, is is essentially at 700 watts is about the size of the power demand of a house. So if they're going to sell 2 million of these things, you're adding a city the size of Phoenix to the power demand balance that hasn't really grown until now. And additionally, there's a lot of state requirements right across the US to reduce fossil fuel use. So at the same time as these uh, certain states, particularly Virginia, Texas with Bitcoin mining, um, California is the natural home of AI. All of them have very strong demand growth for power, which is somewhat, well, it's, it's not been seen for, for, for decades in the US, meeting a sleepy utility that's trying to add a whole load of renewables. And we think that you're going to have some significant traffic accidents and not be able to meet that power demand. So, you know, what do you do in that situation? Do you buy a utility or do you sell one? Well, right now you sell them because they're not doing a very good job of meeting demand. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is that uh, over time, that's probably going to get worse, right? They're going to really struggle to, to just balance power. And power is, is not like oil. Power is instantaneous. And you have to have reserve supply at all times. Obviously, if you've got gas in your in your car, you're quite relaxed about it just sitting there and you just turn it on when you need it. With power, that that electricity needs to be constantly supplied to the household is hugely important to everyone's lives and ultimately leads to major legal arguments if it fails. And that's what you're seeing, for example, with the current, right as we speak, wildfires in Texas, you can see that the utility XL is trading off uh, quite hard on the assumption that they've got some sort of liability for that fire. So right. it's a risky, nasty looking business utilities. And the obvious conclusion to buy them is not uh, is not obvious to me. Now, there are certain IPPs, what the clients really like Vistra in Texas, where they essentially have the power generation capacity and supply the market and therefore make a ton of money from very high prices. And those companies we think are investable. But the standard utilities take a dominion in virginia we don't think they're gonna we think it's going to be a horrible job for them to try and meet this demand one of the ironies is that all this renewable fuel is comes from environmental pressure local environmental pressure is also very strong so basically the same environmentalists that say use more solar and wind also say don't build any transmission you know please don't build a power data center but a power hungry data center in my backyard and so the whole thing turns into a into a giant mess, and that's what we're anticipating next. So the market's buying the NVIDIA picks and shovels trade, but the reality of being able to actually generate the power for the AI boom is highly questionable in my view. But w why is there an underlying assumption that uh, this AI boom will need petroleum and not um, other sources of energy? Yeah, there isn't. I mean, it doesn't need any oil. What it needs is uh, is natural gas. So okay. that's you know that's the same business essentially because because of the interruptibility of solar and wind, all these data centers need highly reliable constant power, and therefore in order to offset the variability of solar and wind, hmm. you need basically nuclear power, which they've been shutting down in California and New York. Um, and if you don't do that, then you simply you have to use either coal, which you can't basically use now, so you have to use natural gas. So okay. it's bullish for the oil and gas industry through natural gas. New York Power is actually highly dual fired. It's like sixty percent oil or gas, but they run almost zero oil because oil is effectively six or seven times the price of of gas right now. Gas is trading at you know a dollar fifty per mmbtu. Oil's trading at eighty two dollars uh, a barrel. It's a six to one ratio calorifically, so you just multiply that dollar fifty by six, and that's what the effective oil price is in calorific terms. So six times one and a half, and I'm getting to nine here. So it's $9 a barrel versus $80 a barrel for oil. 
you're going to use gas. Okay, we're going to talk about geopolitics and oil now, but first a word from our sponsor, NordVPN. On this show, we regularly cover how to grow and protect your assets, but one of your most important assets is your privacy. Every investor needs to protect their digital privacy and footprint against hackers and potential viruses. According to Chainalysis, 2022 was the biggest year ever for crypto hacking, with hackers stealing $3.8 billion in cryptocurrency. And according to Duke University, more than 80% of US companies claim to have been successfully hacked. One of the best ways to protect yourself and your privacy online is with NordVPN. Not only does NordVPN hide your identity online from malicious actors and criminals, but it also comes equipped with malware protection. NordVPN also prevents you from accessing dangerous websites allowing you to enjoy your favorite financial content securely. And the best part is that it is easy to use. Just download and click. NordVPN is available for your phone or computer, and they're currently offering 65% off on a two-year plan plus four extra months. Simply click on nordvpn.com slash David Lin in the description down below to learn more. Uh, there's been a lot of tension in the Middle East, as you know, uh, escalating tensions in the Red Sea. Rocket fire reported off uh, Yemen and the Red Sea in a new suspected attack by the Houthi rebels. This just came in uh, a few days ago, uh, February 27th. I'll just read you a first uh, a paragraph in this article here. Rocket exploded late Tuesday night off the side of a ship traveling through the Red Sea off the coast of Yemen. Authorities said latest suspected attack by uh, the Yemen's uh, Houthi rebels. The attack comes as the Houthis continue a series of assaults at sea over Israel's war on Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And the U.S. and its allies launch airstrikes trying to stop them. How much of this has weighed down or weight uh, or impacted oil at all? Yeah, it has. I mean, it adds to costs and it adds to time to transit. So effectively, it increases the working capital of the business because there's more oil on tankers that are traveling further. And so that raises costs. Now, the cost of transport is a small part of the, the gallon of gasoline, ultimately. But it does add, you know, a buck or two here, depending on on the specifics of the route uh, to any given, uh, you know, the cost of oil essentially goes up. And, uh, and, and that is inflationary. So we see this as inflationary. And ultimately, the oil gets there. You know what I mean? You haven't lost any barrels. The other thing you'll, you can read if you read that story that you just read, and think about it uh, with due respect, is that the, the, the Houthi rockets are not very good. <laughs> I mean, I laugh right. about it, but it's a serious matter. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you have one that explodes next to a ship. They're more like fireworks. The inflationary aspect is also that the U.S. takes a, you know, $150 Houthi firework and blows it out of the air with a $1.2 million missile. And so mm. that's inflationary as well. And we expect, <laughs> by the way, the inflation trade is, is very bullish oil, generally, as a rule. So with Congress actually passing tax cuts, can you believe it, and spending out of their minds this year into an election year, the environment for us remains very inflationary. And and we think that this Fed is going to struggle badly to be able to cut uh, rates to the extent the market expects it. And so that's another reason why we like oil here. Your uh, impact of the Red Sea is 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 very much part of that inflationary call, right? You're adding... You're adding uh, juice to the oil price, which is inflationary, and you're adding uh, costs to a lot of other goods globally that all want to go through the Suez Canal, and you know that's that's also inflationary. Yeah, so, let's talk about inflation just a bit. But uh, going back to the Houthis and the and the Red Sea, I think one of the concerns from investors is whether or not this is going to escalate beyond a point where we're not just concerned about inflation here, Paul. We're concerned about a war that would dramatically spike the oil price uh, just simply out of the need for more oil should there be an actual kinetic war. Is that something that you're looking at? Yeah, the way the market looks at it is the Houthis become Iranian-backed, and then it's a question of what what are the Iranian, what are the mad mullahs doing, you know? And um, they're... Again, it's like the Houthis are kind of, it's asymmetric opposition, right? Ships are very vulnerable and any old person can be a terrorist if they really want to. And it's one of the great, you know, the better, the better angels of our nature is less, not many people actually want to be terrorists. But if you want to be one, you can cause a lot of havoc. And that's essentially what's happening. So the real kinetic threat is relatively very small. Um, but the fear threat, the inconvenience threat, it's like taking your shoes off at the airport. You know what I mean? It's mm. like, come on, man. Anyway, so there's that. But what we watch carefully is the potential always. And we've been watching this for 30 years, by the way, for, yeah. for Iran, Israel, 
uh, US, Iran, you know, these things, there's, there's an overlay here, which is diplomacy, actually, right? Because what you see is the US will loosen or tighten sanctions, even on Russia, you would think that, you know, when we put about as much sanctions on Russia as we already could, but actually, they suddenly announce, you know, even more sanctions. So, uh, you know, there still can be more to be done. And the Iranians are very desperate to export oil, particularly to China. And the Chinese need the oil. So reports of sort of the breakdown of the world are probably yeah. exaggerated. We're also watching the Biden uh, Trump election closely because, you know, that could have a significant outcome for Ukraine war, which would obviously change the oil setup massively if that war was to end. Yeah. Um, so that's the second thing that's out there. The, the specifics of the Israel Palestine conflict are not very oil related. There is some gas production there, but. Essentially, unfortunately, it's a very localized threat. And so further to your question and repeating the answer, you know, what we're really looking is for, for the conflagration to grow. Mm -hmm. But my tendency is to think that with the importance of Iran to Russia, to China, with the importance of actually Russia to India, um, you know, that actually, whilst the headlines look appalling, we'll probably stumble through and get away with this one, I think. But you still have completely intractable problems like Israel, Palestine that are going to remain problems for, you know, I can see a solution in Russia, Ukraine. Uh, to, unfortunately, I can't really see one in Israel, Palestine. So, you know, the situation could easily continue into Israel going after Hezbollah while they're on the job. And Hezbollah is closer to Iran than Hamas. So you could, you know, it, it's a, it's an ongoing real risk, which ultimately tends to be negative for oil because it would be negative for the global economy. So while you might spike oil on fear, you sell the spike. This is an interesting point. Uh, the relationship between geopolitics overall, uh, generally speaking, and oil. I'd like you to comment on this, please. This is a paper written by the ECB, um, published in 2023. I'll just read you a paragraph. It says here, the relationship between geopolitical developments and oil prices is not clear-cut. Historically, there is no clear relationship between oil prices and geopolitical events, such as emerging tensions between countries or terrorist attacks. For example... Immediately after the 9-11 attacks, Brent prices went up by 5%, about five times the average daily change in their Brent price between 2000 and 2023. However, within 14 days, the price dropped by about 25%. Now, when Russia invaded Ukraine, says his paper, in February 2022, Brent prices increased by almost 30% within the first two weeks following the invasion. However, prices then decreased again returning to their pre-invasion levels after around eight weeks. How would you evaluate uh, just these two examples and broadly speaking, geopolitics versus oil? <laughs> I'm tempted to say it's completely boneheaded. <laughs> okay. Of course, I mean, what, what this, <laughs> the, 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 I mean, I don't even know where to start with that. I mean, basically they're saying there's no impact of geopolitics because look, the price spiked and then fell. You know, it's like, come on, man, how dumb is that? What it's telling you, what they're really writing is there is a huge impact of geopolitics on oil. Well, you have 9-11, the price spikes because suddenly everyone's saying it's an attack from Saudi Arabia. And then the price collapses because suddenly everyone says, do you know how many planes are flying in the US at any given time? How, do you know how many planes are in the air in the US? The answer is about 25,000 planes in the air at any time. And it's okay. about, you know, so when you ground every plane at 9-11, you just cut US oil demand in an hour. Sorry, you cut global oil demand in an hour by 2% if you ground every plane in the US. So obviously, mm -hmm. at that point, once you know, after the fear of the attack comes the geopolitical impact of the impact of the impact. And that becomes very bearish for oil. So yeah, it's, it's supporting my prior statement. But the idea that, you know, geopolitics doesn't have anything to do with it is <laughs> Frankly, but, completely okay. boneheaded. All right, but do you, but do, but do you agree? Or you know, it's least... a central banker, man. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> do what, you... what kind of a job have these guys done? I mean, you know, look at the Fed. I mean, it's a joke. You know, it's like, I, I'm not gonna. Doing? I'm not gonna read you the entire paper, but they've 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 got some <laughs> they, they've been made it. some regressions and whatnot. But what what about the general assessment that um, geopolitical risk premiums don't usually stay high? I mean, to their point, the price fell. Yeah, um, no, obviously not, but I mean, of course, you know that's a function of the efficiency of the market. You've got to remember, I mentioned that it's 102 million barrels of oil traded a day at a price of $80 a barrel. This is a serious business, you know, and so what happens is obviously the market, the market's highly efficient. That's one of the things that people miss. 
it's absolutely incredible when you think about it that you can take oil from you know thirty thousand uh, feet under the water in the Gulf right. of Mexico and it be in your tank in New York within a matter of months, basically. So you know the the inventory runs on very low in, the in, industry runs on very low inventory, and that makes it highly susceptible to short term geopolitical shocks. And then it becomes very volatile because essentially, you know, one of the interesting things about tankers, which is the way to play geopolitical risk. Yes, is that actually if the market gets bad enough, the tankers turn into storage units. This is something I've been working on recently. So there's an interesting option value implicit in tankers that uh, I've been thinking about, and and that's really if you if you believe the world's going to hell in a handbasket, which a lot of people do, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But you know, I don't know. My father was evacuated from London during the nineteen late you know 30s early 40s because mm -hmm. london was too dangerous for kids you know what i mean I, the world's not as bad as people think but um yeah so the way to play it it, it is it is a very volatile and a very quick effect the the yes. there is impacts of high prices that you see very clearly for example in u.s gasoline consumption so it's a fascinating market insofar as it um all right well it's just... very efficiently and you know you can actually model it and guess what's going to happen next and that's what we do it's just extremely volatile and it can make you look very stupid pretty regularly because it's so difficult to predict so just on that note um and, and then we'll close off in the geopolitical discussion is there an event or maybe other events uh, besides uh, the middle east or perhaps just the middle east that you could see escalating to a point where uh, your forecast for seventy-five to ninety-five dollars a barrel uh, could be pushed. In other words, the price could be pushed outside of that range because of a geopolitical shock. Well, I, I don't think China's going to invade Taiwan. That's my view. You know, it's the kind of statement that that ultimately you, you kind of end up regretting bitterly the day after when right. Taiwan gets invaded by China. But I just think sure. there's too much at stake for the U.S. and China to risk that. Um, Israel, Iran, people have been telling me that Israel's about to bomb Iran since the 2000s and it never happens. You know, I think people forget how much all of these countries are talking to each other. In fact, the latest conflagration of Hamas arguably related to the Saudis uh, establishing diplomatic relations with Iran. You know, it's probably not unrelated. So, you know, a, a positive theme there is, is you know, un, un, unwound by a, a terrorist reaction to it. But the overall theme is positive in the Middle East in terms of diplomatic relations. And, you know, particularly the Arabs versus the Jews is actually a much calmer situation in many ways than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but there is still a major Palestine problem, which actually pertains to population. This is in many ways a population dispute and population is fascinating insofar as the birth rate in Gaza is one of the highest in the world. I think I read that there's 40,000 pregnant women in Gaza. Mm. And... Um, you know, you have very, very the opposite effect in Japan or in China where population is declining. So it's worth, you know, keeping in mind that a lot of these conflagrations pertain to population pressure and you can predict where those will be and they won't be in Japan. The Middle East is the fastest growing population in the world, essentially, and mm -hmm. that's going to continue to be pretty dramatic, I would think. Okay. Um, Africa continues to struggle along. Latin America, I think, is better. I'm going to Mexico on Monday, and I love going down there. I go down there all the time. I think the economy is doing fine. Um, the main one is is always going to be the question of Russia, Ukraine, and Israel, Palestine, and and that's what you know. <laughs> that's the main ones right now. Sure. Hopefully, there sure. can't be any news. Migrant at, the, at a global mega level as well. Migrant. All of that pertains to migrancy. Migrants. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's a mega theme, which I tend to think is more positive than the average Trump voter, you know, so based not to say I'm not a Trump voter, but to say that uh, my I tend to see that migrant migrant uh, pressure is quite positive, although clearly, it's a major challenge in Europe, because they have too much social uh, entitlement, that is to say they you know, the government are too generous, essentially, and there's too many migrants. So it's a problem there. I think it's less of a problem in the US because the economy is so strong and the social benefits are so low. I shouldn't laugh, but you know, right. less of an issue for the US. And I think it's a real tension in Europe for sure. I, I do want to touch on inflation just uh, very quickly. You mentioned that the inflation trade is positive or beneficial for oil, which actually comes first, inflation overall, the CPI going up uh, or uh, a rise in the oil price causing the headline CPI uh, to go up. Is there is there a causal relationship here? Why don't we write to a university and say, hey, we're going to do a PhD in the causation of oil and inflation, and right. you and I can spend the next seven years <laughs> and do a whole load of work and, and come up with an answer of I'm not really sure. 
um no it's it's a total circular reference obviously yeah. i mean it, it depends the, you know it's very specific to the specific situation so at sure. the moment the fed has printed way too many dollars and can't get the horse back in the barn and that's positive for demand and that's driving up oil prices um if you have an external shock which you arguably don't have at the moment and you won't have because saudi has spare capacity so you're not going to see oil at 120 in my view in the next two years yeah for sure because of the saudi spec capacity then ultimately you know you don't have the mega inflation which is 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 the spike shock of the kind that you got in the 70s with the invasions uh against israel again back in back in the you know the yom kippur war and then uh and then ultimately the iran iraq war were all very inflationary to war because they destroyed supply and just made everything go up in price Mm -hmm. um it's not quite the same as as the overheated market that the fed has created causing demand to be very strong and therefore for the oil price to go up so i would argue the current environment is the gdp is leading the fed is leading inflation and you know we're still in a very accommodative environment right they haven't really mm -hmm. tightened anything <laughs> that's why the nasdaq keeps making all-time highs yeah absolutely and and just on that note uh when oil does go up, is that is that typically um, is that typically, I guess, negative for the large cap stocks? Presumably, any company that utilizes energy would see a shrinking of margins and those that's lower EPS. Or is there no clear defined relationship there? Yeah, no, it's interesting. Again, people tend to be locked into their received wisdom, you know, but the world has actually changed absolutely dramatically in oil over the last 10 to 15 years. And, and that has changed the dynamic of the negative impact of oil on the US, in my view. And I've been arguing this strongly for 10 years now. Um, the reason for that is that essentially back in 2008, when oil hit its all time high, the U.S. was importing about 13 million barrels a day of oil. So oil prices were bad for the U.S. because they crushed our um, balance of trade, you know, current account, et cetera, all that was all negative when oil prices went up. And additionally, we weren't producing a whole lot of oil ourselves. And so we didn't benefit from the industrial activity of higher oil prices. Yeah. The, the U.S. unconventional revolution has changed us to be an exporter of oil. So we've gone from over 10 million barrels a day of imports to 2 million barrels a day of exports. And people just are sort of not aware of the scale of the shift. And that, of course, means that now, and we went from zero natural gas exports by LNG in 2016, you know, just whatever that is, six, seven years ago, to the biggest exporter of LNG globally within that period, incredible effort by the US oil industry. And as a result, you now have major gas exports and major oil exports and as a result, the I think that the higher price tends to be positive for the U.S. because economies such as Texas, which essentially lead the U.S. economy, which in its own right is the 10th biggest economy in the world, um, you know, they boom. And, and, you know, additionally, a lot of what goes on in the U.S., such as in California, is not very oil intense, right? So essentially, Silicon Valley, notwithstanding what I said about NVIDIA chips needing a ton of power, in itself is a hugely value-add low in energy intensity effort you know something like facebook uses a lot of energy but relative to its profits it uses hardly any yes and um so yeah the us i believe that the high oil prices are actually much but were actually good for the us and additionally they have a, a beneficial environmental impact of creating greater efficiency which is not good in the us let's be honest you know people use way too much oil and you could use a way lot less if the price was more sensible but against people's understanding oil prices here are actually very very cheap gasoline prices particularly structurally for sure certainly versus the rest of the world uh all right well let's close off on a few current events and how they may impact the price going forward uh first off russia recently announced a six-month export ban on oil uh starting march 1st um you know the ongoing petroleum ban uh gasoline ban has been uh, a subject of concern for a lot of investors and well, just everybody, especially in Europe. I'll just read you with this article from here uh, from Reuters. Russia has announced a six month ban on gasoline exports from J March 1st to guarantee enough fuel to satisfy domestic demand ahead of planned maintenance work on refineries. Um, this was dated February 27th. As you know, uh, Europe is still purchasing Russian oil via India. It's a loophole. Now, should, should investors expect the price to be pushed up as a result of this ban in the coming weeks? 
yes i mean it, it, the the specifics of it at the margin are, are less impactful obviously than the big picture which is russia invading ukraine and and european gas being cut off those all have a big impact on product markets because essentially once you once you can't supply natural gas the replacement fuel is distillate or yes. diesel you would know as diesel um but gasoline is russia essentially is a product exporter and so if they if they believe they need to sustain their own supply and not export, it's positive for U.S. refiners directly, and um, it is a it is quite a big deal. Gasoline's not their biggest export product; distillate is, so we're much more interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the margin, this is supportive for U.S. refiners. Okay, uh, and then finally, let's talk about this uh, ongoing this feud between Exxon and Chevron over um, over a project. Uh, in Guyana, so Exxon throws a wrench in Chevron's fifty-three billion dollar deal for Hess. Uh, just just came in from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chevron warned investors Monday that Exxon Mobil and China's uh, CNOOC are asserting that they have a right to preempt the company's bid for a stake in the prof a prolific oil project of Guyana, an emerging dispute that could derail Chevron's mega deal for Hess. What do you make of this? What's going on here, and how will it impact the markets? Uh, I mean, it's fascinating. It's it's game theory. It's prisoner's dilemma. You know what happens is that often it, when when co these companies have huge assets, and Guyana is one of the biggest in the world. It's a remarkable oil discovery of remarkable size, tens of billions of dollars of value in that one field, uh, that one block that they've got, Starbrook mm -hmm. as it's known, and Chevron as a result bought Hess, right, which had. The, the 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 second the third position alongside Exxon and Cnuc the Chinese that you mentioned uh, the China's national offshore oil company and essentially Chevron's buying Hess to get Guyana which they need to add to their asset base which is somewhat over concentrated in the Permian in Kazakhstan and in Australia so they want that fourth area that Guyana gives them Western Hemisphere low carbon intensity high quality oil supreme performance of the reservoirs highly profitable and so they're buying Hess in, in particular asset cases which would be any given asset it's quite common in the oil industry that if somebody comes in to buy someone else's share because typically all assets are shared by companies to mitigate risk if it's quite it's quite standard that if someone comes in to buy an asset the original owners of the asset have the right to preempt so they can essentially match the bid uh, to stop themselves being diluted or to stop themselves suffering from a you know bad you know whatever there's numerous reasons why you can imagine you would want the partners to have the option to buy out and sure. they do the question is is that the case in a corporate transaction and you would immediately say i've never heard of it basically <laughs> so right. it, it seems super cheeky that exxon and scenic are saying hey uh you know we think we have preemption rights here which presumably they would have hess sold the asset they would right the question is if hess sells itself doesn't doesn't chevron just become hess and the assets not sold and that's the dispute it's probably a clever power play move by exxon to try and extract some value right because they've got mm -hmm. nothing to lose and they can say hey let's delay this thing uh because we want to have a legal judgment and we're going to take it to arbitration if you end up in arbitration you've like literally all got to fly to the hague and stuff i mean it takes months and that's not what chevron and hess want so the question is, Hess and Chevron frantically with their bankers now have to decide, do we A, you know, firmly deny Exxon's legal rights and then just go through a whole legal process and delay the deal? Or do we look at the present value of the deal and say, look, Exxon, what's it going to cost for you to go away? And, you know, is it 2%? Is it 2 billion? You know, what's your number, man? Yeah. And I can see, uh, or lady, and I can see... Uh, Mike Worth and Darren Woods, who are not hostile towards each other at all, they're, they're more often than not on the same side of the table when they're getting grilled in Washington. I can see them making a deal, you know, but what it is and whether or not it, it's a fascinating question for Chevron. I would love to be in the boardroom and decide what to do next. We had a very similar situation with Chevron for Oxy. It wasn't Chevron for Oxy. We had a very similar situation with Chevron for Anadarko, where Oxy came in as a hostile bidder and bid out Chevron, outbid them. And then Chevron had to decide, do we go higher yeah. or do we walk away? And the, the walk away side of the equation was a billion dollar payoff. Well, certainly this bidding war, uh, the bidding war is kind of a, a signal for a strong appetite for M&A overall in this space. Would you agree? Unfortunately not, because the prices paid have not been 
at a premium you know it's been okay. more like capitulation by management so it's a more negative m a trend it's not a frenzy of everyone trying to buy everything it's actually a frenzy of the biggest oils exxon chevron uh essentially conoco essentially taking out the weak hands uh and those are typically unfortunately managements that get rich by selling and they have done a horrible job of getting a big premium for their companies, essentially because the companies aren't super attractive. That's not the case for Hess, by the way. Hess is super attractive. Some of the other stuff we've seen sell has been, you know, essentially tired, yes. succession issues, um, you know, any one of a number of problems with standalone operation. And that's caused the, the CEO to go, hey, you know what, I'm going to make 30 million bucks if I sell this thing. And, and that's what they do. So it's been kind of frustrating. But the general theme of the industry consolidating into less hands is something that we saw in refining, and it's very powerful for, for profitability. So the theme in general is super positive because the best companies are getting bigger and better, mm -hmm. and they're better able to compete against the NVIDIAs of the world, which frankly, you know, notwithstanding the importance of energy to NVIDIA, as we've highlighted, nobody's particularly interested in oil compared to NVIDIA. Having said that, you know, we're now running because I think people can't buy any more NVIDIA and they, they're thinking actually oil's doing very well at 80 and if we go to 90, they're going to be doing super well. Uh, maybe I should own some of this dividend. Oh, let us know when it gets there, Paul. Uh, we'll we'll follow your lead. We're, yeah. we're, saying, we're yeah. saying run these things into the middle of the year. So um, wish me luck. Yeah, for sure. On that note, let tell us a bit more about your research, what we can learn from you, where we can learn about your work. Sure. So I was, you know, I was a originally at the International Energy Agency, then a consultant at Wood Mackenzie, quite well-known consultancy out of Edinburgh, yeah. global now. And then um, I joined uh, Deutsche Bank in Europe, in Edinburgh, which was great, uh, covering European oils. And then in 2004, I came to the US covering Exxon for Deutsche. I was I always joke I'm an extra in the big short. I was at Deutsche when Lippmann was yelling about the, pro the property crash. Uh, and then in 2013, I quit. Uh, Deutsche to go to Wolf Independent. So that's when I began to understand the independent business model instead of the bulge bracket bank model, which, you know, is is unwieldy and, and somewhat corrupted by conflicts of interest. And from Wolf, I did a short stint at Mizuho, then set up Sankey Research on my own in 2020. It's a subscription service that's really designed for institutional investors, but you can subscribe as a retail investor uh, if you don't like the price too bad. Um, but, you know, we are really more oriented towards institutions and, and that's where we get our ranking from that you referenced at the beginning. The website is Sankey Research. My email is paul at sankeyresearch.com. And, you know, for free, we have a weekly video that people like. So you can sign up to my YouTube video, uh, which costs you a fat zero. <laughs> Fantastic. It's not uh it's not dependent on the oil price. It doesn't go up with the price of oil. <laughs> My appetite for recording the video does. Yeah, man. You'd be surprised. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. That's why I always stayed on the sell side. If you're on the buy side, you work at a hedge fund, you know what they say? You sleep with your book. And <laughs> um yeah, there's no it's funny, there's no people what? don't want a bearish oil analyst, right? And they they also you know have to understand that when when things are bad we get really miserable and when things are booming we love it. So yeah. Just out of curiosity, why did you leave banking? to start your own research firm? Um, because it, essentially the compliance is excessive and it's designed to protect the bank from the dumbest analyst, okay. <laughs> right? And so okay. if you're writing stuff that's a bit edgy, and I mean, I'm look, I'm not talking about, you know, we're highly, by the time you've been- Sure, players, I understand. You're pretty good at, at not writing dumb emails. You know, you don't send tweets, you know, about visiting Africa, then get on a plane. You know what I mean? It's like, okay. you, it's second nature. They always say, you know, just don't do anything that you don't want to see on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And 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 so, you know, the chance of me sending a bad email are pretty low. Um, So, you know, within with that in mind, the excess compliance and because, uh, you know, I'm quite a free, I'm a writer, essentially, that, that was an issue. And then additionally, because of the dynamism of the space, what happens is that Wall Street research is very siloed. So the oil guy covers oil, but God help him if he starts talking about Tesla, because the Tesla analysts are going to lose his mind, right? You, yeah. can't, you can't talk about other people's stuff. Right. You can't wildly speculate about NVIDIA. Whereas being a standalone independent research shop, we a we can talk to bankers. Previously, we couldn't because, you know, obviously we don't have any banking business, so there's no conflict. 
B, we can write about whatever we want. So if we suddenly mm -hmm. get interested in Dominion and Virginia Power, we just go off and write about it. So that's super cool. Um, C, we, you know, again, and that horizontal thing is powerful for clients. And, and, and C, you know, C, within the context of that research, we can say, you know, stuff that you can't say at a bank, which um, is really the bank protecting itself. It's not protecting clients. And so, you know, all of those things together, you also cut out a lot of commuting, you know, other nonsense. I mean, the number of times I took the money laundering course at Deutsche Bank and I was like, I can't launder money. I don't have any account. You know, it's impossible for me as a research analyst to launder money. I took that that compliance course every quarter for 10 years. And then, you know, five, six, seven years later, I see that Deutsche Bank's been fired, whatever it was, half a billion dollars right. for money laundering. <laughs> Epstein's money, well, whatever without, it was, without, you know, without, it's just like, you know, hey, I think you had the wrong guy taking the course, lads, you know what I mean? Without, without giving too many details, and we'll leave it off here. Um, uh, did you ever feel like the sell side had any influence on the research department? The what? Did you ever feel like the sell side of the bank had any influence on the research that uh the research department was putting out uh whether or not the bankers didn't know that's illegal um mm -hmm. now of course it's not an accident that 80 percent of wall street research is either is either buy or hold recommendations and it's it's super stupid because the clients don't really care about the recommendations you know what i mean that's their job what they yeah. want is industry knowledge they do like it if you set out a thesis um and, and risks so they can judge you know the investment case the problem is that you can't have sell recommendations, as you know, because the bankers are not going to be happy. They can't do anything about it. It's too bad mm -hmm. for the bankers. But also the company gets super sulky, and that's why yeah. you're corrupted with Wall Street Research. And it's just a an intractable corruption that obviously you can't have a strong, friendly relationship with a company that you're saying everyone should sell. Mm -hmm. And that's why the research, the recommendations become very corrupted and meaningless and why all the excitement that you have when you're writing for a big bank about is there 10% upside to your price target? Why don't you have 20 sells and 20 buys, all this stuff? It's just like, you know what? The clients don't care anyway, and this is all just basically nonsense. And so now we write research, we actually don't really have recommendations or price targets, and we don't have to. It's just a self-imposed rule essentially by the big banks because they've screwed up so many times. And I haven't, touch mm -hmm. wood, but I'm keeping an eye on myself. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually series 24 so uh, I can compliance myself weirdly. But, really? uh, All right. Well, we'll talk more about some of the companies that you've Yeah, we'll talk more about some of the companies that you've done research on next time. Uh pleasure to meet you Paul. Thank you for joining sure. the program and I'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks. Good stuff. Thank you. And don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Paul in the links down below.